Well, welcome everyone to this session of the Jim Bregman Invites You To series. Uh, I'm Rob Riley, and I'm here as a production staff member along with Pete Mantell. And let me, without any further ado, in introduce uh, Sensei Jim Bregman, 10th Don, America's first Olympic judo medalist, a bronze medal in Tokyo in 1964, a bronze medalist at the World Championships the next year, a uh, multi-time uh, national champion and Pan-American medalist, uh, several times president of the United States Judo Association. And uh, without that, without further ado, Sensei Bregman. Thank you, Rob, very much. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Clyde Worthing. Uh, in this presentation, Clyde and I will have a dialogue about training methods and regimes around the world. He will also share his perspective regarding judo in public schools, which is very important. I'd like to congratulate Clyde, who was recently inducted in the United States Judo Federation Hall of Fame in recognition of his influence, accomplishments, and legacy. He has a long history in the sport of judo. Sensei Worthing has devoted his adult life to competing, coaching, and promoting judo, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. Sensei Clyde began judo in 1964 when I was 22 years old. <laughs> and he was at the age of 20. So we are sort of contemporaries in that regard. He was a member of the world team in 69, 71, 75, 77. In 1976, he was a Pan American gold medalist. He was a North American black belt middleweight champion in 1969, was the nationals, which was the nationals middleweight championship. In addition, he has won 18, that's 18, consecutive Jersey State Championship titles and was a Nationals Master Middleweight in 2001 through 2005. Clyde has extensive experience in teaching and teaching judo history, coaching, includes high school programs which serve over 70 students, which is a great accomplishment. He's also an active member of the Hudson Judo Yudanchikai and continues to lead and serve the judo community in many ways and is a proud example of what judo can do for each individual and for the students that we teach. So with that, Clyde, I want to congratulate you again on your introduction to the United States Judo Federation Hall of Fame. That is quite an accomplishment, and based on the record that I've just read, extremely well-deserved. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your international trips and experiences. Okay, well, I mean, there were mine as a competitor, and, you know, I, I'm an you know, uh, international coach. However, I don't see coaching either on the Olympic level or that. I, mainly I have a, a large club and fortunately I've had students that are capable of competing uh, internationally from the Pan Am to, to the uh, uh, world stage. And, and so consequently, I have experienced going um, to different countries at, with my students and um, to see how they're doing, uh, like it, like I had the uh, World University Games. I had uh, two students compete in them, two different World University Games, uh, which were in Taiwan, and we'll go get to that later because that's where my wife is from. So we had a very nice connection there. Uh, I've been to places like Luxembourg, Argentina, uh, Canada on a regular basis. So uh, from a uh, you know, I would say high-level uh, club coaches' perspective, uh, 
I've gotten to make a lot of observations. And basically, uh, you know, with my judo history, you could, you know, just see the progression of where were we then, where are we now, and, and what's, what's happening with the rest of the world. I think, and, and again, as I go on with what I say in this interview, is really not to be critical of anyone. Uh, everyone, whether it be US, USA Judo, JF, JA, everyone cares about Judo, and there's a lot of great people in Judo. There's disagreements, uh, how things are done, and uh, sometimes plenty of blame to go around for why we don't have the success that, you know, a country our size and with our, uh, you know, resources should should be. Um, and sadly, uh, if you look at uh, the amazing Olympics we had with Travis and Kayla in Brazil, and and again, an awful lot of most of the resources were put into that success along with Marty. Um, if you see what we've done internationally since then, it, it, it's been quite disappointing. And, um, uh, you know, the, I, I guess there's a lot of reason that you could say for that. But getting back to just my personal view is I, I what concerns me is uh, how do we stand up to the other national programs? OK, so what do I mean by programs? Um, well, you know, I mean, France, Brazil, all of them have just amazing programs that you see the results from. But let's take a little smaller programs or local you know, national programs. Um, the, the first example that comes to mind is Canada's program. Um, they, Canada's six, six, uh, a six hour drive from, from New York City. Okay, and you go there, Montreal has one of their national training centers. Uh, we've taken advantage of it almost every time we could, but uh, where we have one national coach that more oversees things rather than coaching, uh, Canada has six national coaches that get paid upwards of 60000 a year plus expenses, and then they have Nicholas Gill, who uh, has taken over uh, for Sensei Nakamura to run the oversee the national program, and uh, you you say, gee, those athletes go; they can live in a, in a cosmopolitan city like Montreal. They have a whole weekly training schedule set out. You know, they have personal trainers, uh, dietitians. Uh, they have physical therapists to rehab them, and in addition to that, you see the records they're putting on nationally. They they are on definitely on on pace to probably have at least three Olympic medals, which is outstanding. But the thing is, they're right next to us, and their success is just pulling away from the success you see in us. I, and uh, another example is Taiwan. As I we've been going there about the last three years. And because of my wife's uh, connections there, we made you know good friends with the judo community. So we've been going to the Taipei Open, which is an outstanding event. But we also got to train with the um, Taipei uh, University teams. That now they have a university system where they have uh, three sports colleges, and each one of them has a a judo program that has about 30 scholarship athletes. Uh, male and female, and they practice every single day. They've actually brought in a coach from Belarus for the European things and all. And if you want to see an, an example of their program's progress versus U.S., uh, if you just go back to the Osaka World Cup last year, um, and the teams were rated by medals and matches won, okay? Uh, uh, Taiwan played, was rated ranked eighth of the countries that competed. The United States had a full team. Taiwan did not have a full team, by the way. And we were ranked 28th, uh, which made us tied with four other teams because 
Uh, there were 32 teams there, and, and they cut it off at, at 28. So what, what do you say to that? Uh, and, and, again, it, it's discouraging. And, again, those athletes, they make the sacrifices. They spend the money to try to do with this new system. Uh, I'm sure, you know, when you made the Olympics, you had to win a, a U.S. Uh, nationals trial, and you could go to the Olympics. Now, because it's, they've made it more like soccer, where they're only taking 32 people, the athletes have to go and pick up the points wherever they can. And that I sometimes they go to Africa because there's no high-level competition there. I knew one guy that went to Borneo to pick up points. And uh, can you imagine what that costs? But because, oh, that's a small tournament that I can get some points in. And, uh, and so, as you say, uh, just look at those program comparisons uh, and the, I'm, these, I'm not comparing us to Britain, you know, the powers like Brazil, Germany, the Netherlands that have those really high powered programs, Japan, Korea, and, and, and so forth. I, I'm talking about two, what you would consider one country like us and one big island that, that we're not, uh, we're not, that it, they're drawing away from us. And, uh, and, and that's the unfortunate part. So if you say, okay, what are the reasons for that? Um, well, it's, it's always been a problem of funding. And you, it's just like if you're a poor kid and you can't go to a good college, uh, your possibilities are not going to be as good as the kid that, you know, has more financial backing and, and all the things that come with, uh, with, with success. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, as I say, it's not to uh, be derogatory by anybody because all these, all these kids are great. You know, the coaches, I mean, well, but there is no national program. And um, uh, I, I really don't know what the answer is uh, because we're not being led in that direction. And uh, that's just basically my take on what I see as an, indiv as an individual. So many of the more successful countries actually have government funding behind them, don't they, Clyde? I would say they do. I'm not, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm not completely privy to it, but it mm -hmm. appears, and I know Canada does have uh, national funding. And, of course, that is a problem. And, you know, again, we don't, uh, we're not able to skirt that by our popularity. So, so if you're in wrestling, basketball, uh, track and field, where there's a big popularity and a lot of college money and all goes into it, well, that's why we're the best in the world in those sports, whereas judo hasn't been able to break through on that. Is it the fault of anyone? I don't know. Is there more we could do? I wish. But, you know, that's been a struggle since our days, Jim. I think you'll mm -hmm. agree on that. And the, the the saddest part is, you know, going to the Olympics in many ways is a dream. And you have to dream that dream to go there, number one. But also a lot of these young people are basically sold a dream. Oh, yeah, you train there, you go there, do this, you can go to the Olympics. And even the best of countries, Japan, Germany, Canada, all of them have plenty of people that don't make it to the Olympics uh, in spite of their program. It's still a very uh, elite group of, of people that make it, but uh, their, their chances are much higher than ours. Uh, you'd, I think you'd have to agree, right? I do agree with that. Yeah. So one of the ideas that has been percolated in the United States for a long time is that we need to grow a bigger base of judo. Absolutely. And I understand that you have a club and have had a club for many, many years at a school that has a very large number of students. How do you develop a school program or a club program and attract many, many more students in France, for example, they have about 650,000 registered members. 
In the United States, we are, to say the least, much below that number. What can we do to grow grassroots judo so that we have a base at a pyramid? And if we had 600,000 members, I don't think we'd have a financial problem. Not only would you not have a financial problem, you would have a pool of athletes because the top 1% of 500,000 is a lot uh, you know, more intense than you know, the 1% of, of 50,000. So in other words, if you create the larger base, you, have, you will be able to have those athletes. And then again, uh, most likely, you know, the, the revenue from those organizations would, uh, well, first of all, 500,000, you could get sponsors to say, hey, listen, I'm hitting 500, you know, 500,000 families here. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, armor, you know, I'm uh, a hammer strength or uh, I'm uh, Nike or, or someone, you're going to look at, hey, let's get those judo folks in here. Right now, uh, the sponsors are, you know, creams that you rub on that, you know, are, are not household names. And again, thankfully, we have them, but uh, we, we just are not getting the high powered sponsors uh, that you get uh, a lot of places. And, and the thing is, uh, if you go back to early on, the, you know, the, uh, Jose Rodriguez, who was you know, on the Olympic Committee with the track and field and then switched over to judo, one of the reasons they took a non-judo person in was he was supposed to be able to attract those uh, those high uh, uh, high level sponsors, you know, and and again that never materialized. So consequently, I, I think a lot of money was put at you know it, to get the immediate gratification, and consequently after Travis and Kayla were left with 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 a very underdeveloped uh, cadet and IJF program, you know, so. Uh, but uh, but uh, getting to how do we build a base? Well, I was watching your seminar with Jimmy Pedro. His idea of teaching was great. First, make a great business where you build your student base, where they come, not for the Olympics, not because they're going to be national champions. I mean, Jim, you've been to, we've been to the camps and all, and how many people are talking about you want to be an Olympian or you, you do this, you grip this way or whatever. And, you know, the, the, the thing is, it doesn't take long before these kids get to a, where, where the level where they could really be developing, get disappointed because the expectations of them that a coach and their parents has put on them, uh, make it like, gee, what do I want to get, you know, criticized because I lost? because everybody caught up to me and I was probably uh, a more mature athlete when I was 10 through 15. And then other kids found weights and, uh, you know, and, and, and growth spurts and everything else. And uh, that I, I, and I, and again, we've all seen this rodeo so many times, uh, how many kids of just great potential they get to that point. And, uh, you know, other things uh, are, are more palatable they're not as difficult, and they're not the stars that for that time, which is supposed to happen. You're supposed to battle your way through that to the next level, and and there there is you know just not a support good support group for that. You know, so that that's a problem. So in other words, to say grow the base, make judo great, make it a great sport. Look look what we did with soccer. Uh, we brought Pele in. I mean, who took soccer when we were in high school? Nobody. There was no soccer in your high school or my high school. The Cosmos brought Pele in, and all the people, uh, not only foreigners were, that knew soccer were happy, but all of a sudden Americans were finding them out, man, what a great sport. Look, you can put uh, 400 kids in the park and a couple of little standards and nets, and they have a ball uh, because it's, it's, it's just a great sport. That's universally the success of soccer and why it's a great sport. Well, guess what? Judo is the second most popular sport. Why? For many of the same reasons. You you put the kids in geese. They can play games. They can uh, learn to 
uh, do basic things in a respectful manner. And, and by the way, they can move on and compete at a certain time, but you can have fun in judo. Judo is a great sport if you let it be. If you uh, take the little kids and make pit bulls out of them, and I'm sure you've seen this rodeo many times, the coach is screaming and yelling at eight-year-old kids, the kids walking off the mat crying, the parents are snatching them because they lost. I mean, I, I, are you kidding me? Uh, I was at uh, the uh, the Open in Florida, and they had a, a, a guy from France. It was amazing. He said uh, he could teach you judo on concrete, and he was showing me yeah, how to do uchikomas with just a belt and stuff like that. And and the Open is a huge tournament, a lot of kids from six-year-olds and up. And he says to me, he says, uh, you know, I had a nice time come to the camp here. He said, but I don't understand why people are coming all over the country to compete six, eight, nine, ten-year-olds. He said, in Europe, we don't do that. We, you know, we give them fun little local tournaments, but it's not till about 13 or 14 that we start to get a little more serious competition. And again, that pretty much says it all. I mean, first of all, if a kid's been screamed and yelled at like that for since he's eight years old, believe me, by, by 16, he's ready to start smoking a joint and say, I'm tuning out of this. You know, so sorry to say, but they, you, they, they find every excuse not to do it. And uh, I even my, I have, my, my son is a very good player, but I, I told him, listen, uh, I'm not going to be daddy coach over you. You know, I said, I'm your dad. At a certain point, you know, number one and most important. And secondly, you're a judo player. And guess what? In, in my club, you're getting treated just like everybody else. If you succeed or don't succeed, that's fine. I, I'm going to maintain my integ integrity. And you're not, and the other kids are not going to be cannon fodder to develop you. You, and if you do it, you do it because you want to do it. And, uh, and that's been very successful to me. Amazingly, he's almost re-stimulated himself to do it. And I'm like, hey, do whatever you want with it. And, uh, you know, I recall a conversation that we had coming back from uh, the Xanax Cup in Japan. It was a great experience. Uh, I guess he was probably 14 or 15. And, uh, you know, so they had you know, a couple hundred, uh, they had like 70 Japanese teams and they invited six foreign teams, including the U.S. And we were writing back, he said, Dad, how did you... Well, if I went to the Olympics, and I said, Brennan, you know, nothing would be more thrilling to me than that. And I said, I would give you all the support in the world I can. But I said, I'll tell you right now, don't do it for me. You do it for yourself. The price is so dear. You're going to have injuries. You're going to have, have dis financial disappointments. I said, it, it is a tremendous undertaking. And I would never ask you to do it for anyone but yourself. And I, and that goes for every student I have, you know, uh, you know and, and with us, why start with the Olympics as the standard? Start with winning the national championships. Well, you know, in 69, I had 73 guys in my division when I broke through, 73. Do you know how many uh, middleweights there were in the last uh, nationals? 20. And now, uh, and, and, and I, I, I was, uh, uh, you know, in, in discussion with USA Judo over this, I said, you know, if you don't make the nationals meaningful, well, how do you, you know, it's like eh, the nationals, I'd rather go to the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico or, or Luxembourg and pick up some points or and most likely lose after one match than go to our nationals and make it a real intense uh, tournament where the good players have to fight. In Canada, they make them fight. They have the top eight. You have to fight if you're, other unless you're injured and you better be there. So what happens? There is competition and the good guys know they better step their game up or someone's going to be biting at their heels. And we, so, you know, what little we have I just think that there's so much more we can do with it to build a, a bigger base. Take the pressure of, of making the Olympics off for, for uh, you know, for one or two rounds, which <laughs> you, um, sadly, 
probably won't meddle in uh, uh, and, and back it down. Build, work on, build, on base building, work on, on national competition, make, all, you know, make, make the nationals something to be proud of winning. Now it's, it's an after the fact, you know? So, I mean, that's my view on that. You know? Well, it's very interesting observation, Clyde. Uh, I think that fundamentally in many dojos, we've taken the fun out of judo for the kids. Absolutely. And when you take the fun out of judo, <clears throat> it's much more pleasant for a young person between the ages of, say, eight years old and 18 years old to go play soccer, tennis, or whatever they want to do. So I think that we have to emphasize to our national coaches and teachers not to emphasize the winning of competitions, but to emphasize the fact that you can enjoy this sport as a form of physical education and discipline and concentrate on learning the techniques rather than shooting for an Olympic medal at the age of 20, okay? You're not gonna get an Olympic medal at the age of 20 unless you really love the sport and come up through a system that allows you the opportunity to fail and allows you the opportunity to learn from your failures and become a better technician. And I think that the emphasis on anyone winning major tournaments below the age of 15 is misplaced. Absolutely. I, um, I, you know, my, some of the most successful things we do that you know, keeps judo in our areas, and, and Jimmy was saying too, yeah, have, uh, if you want to have a tournament, have an in-club tournament. You match them up. Give everybody a medal. Make it fun. Have, uh, you know, uh, donuts and coffee or juice or hot dogs afterwards. Uh, you know, the parents come away with a good experience. Even the kid lost. I mean, I, I've, and, you know, one thing we do, and, and a lot of people complain, you know, actually criticize, well, what kind of competition is this? Every kid gets a medal. Well, well by God, I've seen kids that, got, that lost two matches and got that bronze medal, and they were the happiest kids in the world. And guess what? They were back in their club on Monday. You know, the kid that got tuned up and, and lost, uh, got matched up again, overmatched, uh, goes home with nothing. And guess what? Uh, I'm, I'm done with judo. I, I, you know, I hate it. It sucks. People are yelling at you. And, uh, you know, this is a very simple, basic thing. But I, I just, you know, I guess a lot of uh, instructors didn't come up that way. They came up with a competition and you did this and I did that. And uh, I, I'm like, you know, gee, you know, you, you just really don't get it. So how are you going to teach? You're going to teach the same way that you will yell that and, and how you should compete. And uh, I, there's no, no seven-year-old should be crying after a match at a tournament. It should be a, a you know, a, a, a valuable experience. And, and he shouldn't even be in, in, a, in a venue with a thousand people uh, and people yelling and screaming. And that he is, he, so, you know, you know, people never put themselves in the place of a little kid uh, looking up at a, at a grown person yelling at you, telling you you didn't perform good enough or you could have beat that kid or, or whatever. And uh, I mean, Americans are guilty of that in many other areas besides judo. Don't take me wrong. But that specifically is one of the reasons you, don't, you, you can't build judo easily. Right. And I, I remember growing up in the, the Washington Judo Club, we had many Kohaku, uh, Kohaku Shiais mm -hmm. where you just lined everybody up and you stayed up as long as you can. You had one person refereeing. Then you mixed the group up a little bit. You had another round. And it seems to me that even at a base level, the Kohaku Shiai was a way to allow people to develop technique without concentrating on the metal production. Mm -hmm. I think that at a certain stage, we've taught from the age of eight years old 
that metal production is what is most important. My personal opinion is that the most important thing is one, to enjoy the sport and have fun, and two, to relish in learning the techniques of the sport so that you can become proficient in the waza aspect of the sport. If you function on those two things, then I think at a certain level from 15 and forward, the young person has an arsenal of tools that they can work with and apply in larger competitions. Uh, number one, allow them to be kids. That's not a crime, by the way. Right. And, you know, I often tell parents, coaches, I said, you know what? You're not going to determine whether this kid is a national champion or not. That kid is going to determine it. You're not going to determine it. You, you may think all you're doing pushing them, you may see, see success and all, but that's not really happening unless that kid wants to happen. And if he's doing it because he's afraid, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, of being yelled out of consequences, the minute he gets a chance, he's going to feign an injury or he's going to be out of there when you, when you can't control him anymore. And that's, and, and that's the, tr the truth. You know, they're, they're, they're the one that's that are going to uh, decide – how successful they will be. You're not, you're not the one. I mean, you can pro provide all the avenues and channels. And if you're smart, you'll get the kid to want to be there and want to do the work. Uh, if you're a motivator and if the kid is motivated, but otherwise it's not going to happen. No matter how you say this kid could have been this, been that. And we've, we've seen, as I say, we've seen, because we've been around so long, we've seen that cycle so many times, you know, it's true. So let me ask you, Clyde, how did you get your school program started and what recommendations would you have to other teachers to approach different schools and get judo into school programs? Okay. Um, we have to go back to the better lucky than good theory. <laughs> so uh, I, I was very fortunate in the sense that I was running a, a corporate recreation center for in New Jersey for uh, a, a transport company. And there happened to be a vocational school up on top of the hill. So basically it, it was a uh, satellite school. You did your vocational classes at that time, you know, things like auto mechanics and uh, baking and things like that. And then you went back to your school for phys ed and academia. But the school wanted to, to, to try a new kind of program, which is high tech high, the school I work for. They started with 30 kids and they didn't have a gym. So I had this beautiful NBA sized gym and they said, Clyde, you know, we don't have a gym teacher. You know, do you have college and all? Would you teach the kids gym twice a week? I said, sure, bring, bring them down. And, you know, I was compensated for it. And naturally I said, okay, uh, would anybody like to try a little judo, you know? So, you know, they were learning rollouts and stuff, and, and they had a, had a great time with it. So the next year, um, it got a little bigger and a little bigger. So uh, uh, eventually, as it grew, I, I was still basically a, a PE full-time substitute along with running the, uh, the other facility as, a, as the director of recreation. Uh, which was a great combination of making money for me. And then the transport company actually uh, uh, went, went, went out of business. You know, they, they declared bankruptcy. So I was out of that job and the school, you know, by that time I had had about six or seven years with the school. I negotiated a lease deal with them and all. So they said, Clyde, uh, don't worry. Uh, we're going to bring you and also, um, Leo Victoria, he's been to camp with us, uh, who was mm -hmm. a National Columbian champion. I, he was working in the school and working towards his degree for a teaching degree. So they brought us both in. I, I was able to go to a thing called alternate route and, um, and get my degree. And Leo went on to get his. But we all always had judo involved as a club. And then we actually were able to bring it into it phys ed classes. So we had a, because of the, the way the layout of the facility had, almost all schools have 
a big gym and you do, okay, we're doing basketball this time, volleyball, uh, or, and, and basically you were told which activity you were going to learn because they thought that's what you, you needed to be exposed to everything. For, we ended up saying, guys, look, we can only take so many of you for tennis, so many of you can use a weight room, so many of you can play basketball, and uh, we have a little judo yoga room where you could choose that. So the, all our kids uh, for, for years and years have been able to choose the activity they wanted, which just is a whole new concept for most uh, general kids. Yeah. Well, guess what? They, you know, kids start taking judo in class and having a good time. So we, we actually uh, said, okay, well, we're going to have it after school. And we also made it a credited subject. So after school, you get credits for it. And, and our kids are selected from a, a very, uh, very high pool of, of, of really intellectual kids. And they, uh, the idea of getting credits on top of that, well, hey, I'm for that. But uh, we got so we were taking them to the high school nationals and all and uh, you know, through our and and the the, the program just be, ended up becoming part of the school. Now, prior to that, I also had the the APA recreation was an open judo club. So and we were bringing in revenue. So the school says, so what we we do with that? So I said, well, there's twenty thousand dollars in the fund there. You know, you, you know, the school can take it, and the money can continue to go to you. I would like to continue with the open program, all right, go ahead. So meanwhile, so we started generating all this revenue and then uh, we, you know, did some rentals for running the promotionals. And then I, you know, ran a tournament and they see all this money coming in. They're like, wow, you know, and can we take this? And I mean, it, and, and I didn't have, I didn't want any control of it. That's your money. If anyone pays, it pays for the school. I'm getting paid fine. Uh, my, the other instructor is getting paid fine. So all of a sudden we became a cash cow. And, uh, and although 85 or $90,000 a year uh, is not a huge amount of money, if you, after school budget runs out, being able to have, you know, uh, you know a couple thousand dollars that you can get your hands on with, without any questions, without going to school board begging or whatever, it's huge. So, I mean, the... The, 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 the business manager loved us, you know, the principals loved us. And then we, we completely funded all the judo. Every kid we buy, you know, you know, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of jackets and belts. And, you know, we let them wear sweatpants to avoid having to change the whole thing. And then the, the kids that really want to do it, uh, we give them full uniforms or, or very highly discounted. And so, and then we had the tech judo t-shirt. So in our school, and we didn't have that many sports. We actually, they took all the sports out because we're a county school and there was a conflict between us and the other one. So, I mean, again, sometimes the stars line up. So every kid in the school knows what judo is. Mm -hmm. if, if they weren't doing it, one of their friends is walking around with a tech judo t-shirt or, wow, you know, they look at all the money they made. And then I come up at the day after a tournament and, and throw like uh, you know twenty five hundred dollars in in cash and three thousand dollars in checks on the into the deposit. They're like, man, th this is crazy. I mean, the principal once said, "Geez, those judo people got more money than God," you know. So, uh, so I, I, anyway, to say that was uh, just very uh, good fortune and good people and you know good instruction. I, I think I that Leo and I managed that very well. However, we ran also, to show the other side of the picture, we ran into uh, a problem that more than likely we will run into in schools. So we have a sister school, just like ours. And I had, uh, I, I'm sure you know, remember Salama used to come to camp. He, well, he was a graduate of the program from ninth grade on through, and he was in college and in the area. So I said, gee, how about Salama, you can make some extra money and we'll, we'll have a judo program in our sister school. We'll buy all the flexi roll mats enough for a nice, you know, 30 by 36 area. Uh, we'll 
purchased all the jackets. All you do is go in and teach and you'll get paid. Well, guess what? The, between the, the, the territor territorialism, I guess, of the dance studio, the phys ed people, we, we couldn't get space. They wouldn't give us the space to do it. I, even I said, well, how about you fold up some cafeteria tables at that time of day? Uh, I mean, so finally, I mean, that, and the, the school principal was all for it. Uh, the school superintendent was for it, but you couldn't break in that way. So, so basically what I'm saying is uh, having that, that inside track is kind of uh, makes it difficult, and especially in public schools. Now, you, if you find charter schools, Catholic schools, and other schools that are always trying to improvise uh, their programs and all, they definitely would more than likely be more receptive. And I, I mean, I taught YMCA's and and things like that uh, when I was uh, coming up to because I was training and teaching judo, and uh, and I actually did quite well with it. But uh, you know, the thing that you could sell, especially in the high school, is that hey, it's you know they all the schools have adult education programs we'll put it under the umbrella like it's part of the adult education and you can offer it for kids and 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 the parents or seniors uh and a big sell is you have them join usa judo jf or ja and you tell them listen our program is fully insured up for up to a million dollars all of our instructors we have to uh, be background checked and also that is an uh, uh, an opener. That was a big sell for my school. And I say, guys, we're totally. What you mean? The you you have the liability and all. Yes, complete liability. Here's your insurance certificate. Huge seller. And then so you say later on, say, well, okay, and, and you know the money can go to school or you pay me so much like you would another instructor for it. And um, you know, eventually, if you get the traction, you could say, hey, we'll run a little tournament. I know a couple of other clubs that will come and do it on their own. I mean, even myself, it's as I look back, I say, man, how did we ever accomplish all that? But it was just, you know, having good people, good reputation and all. But it, it, it is uh, a, a basically uh, a, a one model that you could use for that. You know.